Hi class, good morning. Um, I appreciate the feedback from all of you who did your exit tickets yesterday. It seemed like this worked well for most of you, so we're going to continue on in the same format. So let's go ahead and dive right into chapter three. At the Villa Genevieve. In a moment, Poirot had leapt from the car, his eyes blazing with excitement. He caught the man by the shoulder. What is that you say? Murdered? When? How? The sergeant de ville drew himself up. I cannot answer any questions, monsieur. True, I comprehend. Poirot reflected for a minute. The commissary of police, he is without doubt within? Yes, monsieur. Poirot took out a card and scribbled a few words on it. Voila! Will you have the goodness to see that this card is sent in to the commissary at once? The man took it and, turning his head over his shoulder, whistled. In a few seconds, a comrade joined him and was handed Poirot's message. There was a wait of some minutes, and then a short, stout man with a huge mustache came bustling down to the gate. The sergeant de ville saluted and stood aside. "'My dear Monsieur Poirot!' cried the newcomer. "'I am delighted to see you. Your arrival is most opportune.' Poirot's face had lighted up. "'Monsieur Bex, this is indeed a pleasure.' He turned to me. This is an English friend of mine, Captain Hastings, Monsieur Lucien Bex. The commissary and I bowed to each other ceremoniously. Then Monsieur Bex turned once more to Poirot. Mon vieux, I have not seen you since 1909, that time in Ostend. I heard that you had left the force? So I have. I run a private business in London. And you say you have information to give which may assist us? Possibly you know it already. You were aware that I had been sent for? No. By whom? The dead man. It seems he knew an attempt was going to be made on his life. Unfortunately, he sent for me too late. Sacré tonnerre! ejaculated the Frenchman. So he foresaw his own murder? That upsets our theories considerably. But come inside. He held the gate open, and we commenced walking towards the house. Monsieur Bex continued to talk. The examining magistrate, Monsieur Ote, must hear of this at once. He has just finished examining the scene of the crime and is about to begin his interrogations. A charming man. You will like him. Most sympathetic. Original in his methods, but an excellent judge. When was the crime committed? asked Poirot. The body was discovered this morning about nine o'clock. Madame Renaud's evidence and that of the doctors goes to show that the death must have occurred about two a.m., but enter, I pray of you. We had arrived at the steps which led up to the front door of the villa. In the hall, another sergeant de ville was sitting. He rose at sight of the commissary. Where is Monsieur Hote now? inquired the latter. In the salon, Monsieur. Monsieur Bex opened a door to the left of the hall, and we passed in. Monsieur Hote and his clerk were sitting at a big round table. They looked up as we entered. The commissary introduced us and explained our presence. Monsieur Ote, the juge d'instruction, was a tall, gaunt man with piercing dark eyes and a neatly cut gray beard, which he had a habit of caressing as he talked. Standing by the mantelpiece was an elderly man with slightly drooping shoulders, who was introduced to us as Dr. Durand. Most extraordinary, remarked Monsieur Ote as the commissary finished speaking. You have the letter here, Monsieur? Poirot handed it to him, and the magistrate read it. Hmm, he speaks of a secret. What a pity he was not more explicit. We are much indebted to you, Monsieur Poirot. I hope you will do us the honor of assisting us in our investigations. Or are you obliged to return to London? Monsieur le juge, I propose to remain. I did not arrive in time to prevent my client's death, but I feel myself bound in honor to discover the assassin. The magistrate bowed. These sentiments do you honor. Also, without doubt, Madame Renault will wish to retain your services. We are expecting Monsieur Giraud from the Surete in Paris at any moment, and I am sure that you and he will be able to give each other mutual assistance in your investigations. In the meantime, I hope that you will do me the honor to be present at my interrogations, and I need hardly say that if there is any assistance you require, it is at your disposal. 
I thank you, monsieur. You will comprehend that at present I am completely in the dark. I know nothing whatever. Monsieur Ote nodded to the commissary, and the latter took up the tale. This morning, the old servant Françoise, on descending to start her work, found the front door ajar. Feeling a momentary alarm as to burglars, she looked into the dining room, but seeing the silver was safe, she thought no more about it, concluding that her master had, without doubt, risen early and gone for a stroll. Pardon, monsieur, for interrupting, but was that a common practice of his? No, it was not, but old Francoise has the common idea as regards the English, that they are mad and liable to do the most unaccountable things at any moment. Going to call her mistress as usual, a younger maid, Leonie, <clears throat> was horrified to discover her gagged and bound, and almost at the same moment news was brought that Monsieur Renaud's body had been discovered, stone dead, stabbed in the back. Where? That is one of the most extraordinary features of the case, Monsieur Poirot. The body was lying, face downwards, in an open grave. What? Yes, the pit was freshly dug, just a few yards outside the boundary of the villa grounds. And he had been dead. How long? Dr. Durand answered this. I examined the body this morning at ten o'clock. Death must have taken place at least seven and possibly ten hours previously. Hmm... That fixes it at between midnight and 3 a.m. Exactly, and Madame Renault's evidence places it at after 2 a.m., which narrows the field still further. Death must have been instantaneous, and naturally could not have been self-inflicted. Poirot nodded, and the commissary resumed. Madame Renault was hastily freed from the cords that bound her by the horrified servants. She was in a terrible condition of weakness, almost unconscious from the pain of her bonds. It appears that two masked men entered the bedroom, gagged and bound her, whilst forcibly abducting her husband. This we know at second hand from the servants. On hearing the tragic news, she fell at once into an alarming state of agitation. On arrival, Dr. Durand immediately prescribed a sedative, and we have not yet been able to question her. But without doubt, she will awake more calm and be equal to bearing the strain of interrogations. <clears throat> The commissary paused. And the inmates of the house, monsieur? There is old Francoise, the housekeeper. She lived for many years with the former owners of the village in Evieve. Then there are two young girls, sisters, Denise and Léonie Hullard. Their home is in Merlinville, and they come of the most respectable parents. Then there is the chauffeur, whom Monsieur Renaud brought over from England with him. But he is away on a holiday. <clears throat> Finally, there are Madame Renault and her son, Monsieur Jacques Renault. He, too, is away from home at present. Poirot bowed his head. Monsieur Ote spoke. Marchand! The sergent de ville appeared. Bring in the woman, Francoise. The man saluted and disappeared. In a moment or two, he returned, escorting the frightened Francoise. Your name is Francoise Arrichet? Yes, Monsieur. You have been a long time in service at the village in Evieve. Eleven years with Madame la Vicomtesse. Then, when she sold the villa this spring, I consented to remain on with the English milor. Never did I imagine. The magistrate cut her short. Without doubt, without doubt. Now, Francoise, in this matter of the front door, whose business was it to fasten it at night? Mine, monsieur. I always, always I saw to it myself. And last night... I fastened it as usual. You are sure of that? I swear it by the blessed saints, monsieur. What time would that be? The same time as usual. Half past ten, monsieur. What about the rest of the household? Had they gone up to bed? Madame had retired some time before. Denise and Leonie went up with me. Monsieur was still in his study. Then, if anyone unfastened the door afterwards, it must have been Monsieur Renaud himself. Francoise shrugged her broad shoulders. What should you do that for? With robbers and assassins passing every minute. A nice idea. Monsieur was not an imbecile. It is not as though he had to let Set Dame out. The magistrate interrupted sharply. Set Dame? What lady do you mean? Why, the lady who came to see him. Had a lady been to see him that evening? But yes, monsieur, and many other evenings as well. Who was she? Did you know her? 
A rather cunning look spread over the woman's face. How should I know who it was, she grumbled. I did not let her in last night. Aha! roared the examining magistrate, bringing his hand down with a bag on the table. You would trifle with the police, would you? I demand that you tell me at once the name of this woman who came to visit Monsieur Renault in the evenings. The police, the police, grumbled Francoise. Never did I think that I should be mixed up with the police. <sighs> but I know well enough who she was. It was Madame de Breuil. The commissary uttered an exclamation and leaned forward as though in utter astonishment. Madame de Breuil, from the Villa Marguerite, just down the road? That is what I said, monsieur. Oh, she is a pretty one, celle-là. The old woman tossed her head scornfully. Madame de Breuil, murmured the commissary. Impossible. Voila, grumbled Francoise. That is all you get for telling the truth. Not at all, said the examining magistrate soothingly. We were surprised, that is all. Madame de Breuil then, and Monsieur Renaud, they were... He paused, delicately. Eh? It was that without doubt? How should I know? But what will you? Monsieur, he was milord anglais, très, très riche. And Madame de Breuil, she was poor, that one, and très chic for all that she lived so quietly with her daughter. Not a doubt of it, she has had her history. She is no longer young, but ma foi, I who speak to you have seen the men's heads turn after her as she goes down the street. Besides, lately, she has had more money to spend. All the town knows it. The little economies, they are at an end. And Francoise shook her head with an air of unalterable certainty. Monsieur Ote stroked his beard reflectively. And Madame Renault? He asked at length, how did she take this friendship? Francoise shrugged her shoulders. She was always most amiable, most polite. One would say that she suspected nothing. But all the same, is it not so? The heart suffers, monsieur. Day by day, I have watched Madame grow paler and thinner. She was not the same woman who arrived here a month ago. Monsieur, too, has changed. He also has had his worries. One could see that he was on the brink of a crisis of the nerves. And who could wonder with an affair conducted in such a fashion? No reticence, no discretion, style anglais, without doubt. I bounded indignantly in my seat, but the examining magistrate was continuing his questions, undistracted by side issues. You say that Monsieur Renaud had not to let Madame de Breuil out? Had she left then? Yes, monsieur. I heard them come out of the study and go to the door. Monsieur said good night and shut the door after her. What time was that? Uh, about twenty-five minutes after ten, monsieur. Do you know when Monsieur Renault went to bed? I heard him come up about ten minutes after we did. The stair creaks so that everyone hears everyone who goes up and down. And that is all? You heard no sound of disturbance during the night? Nothing whatever, monsieur. Which of the servants came down the first in the morning? I did, monsieur. At once I saw the door swinging open. What about the other downstairs windows? Were they all fastened? Every one of them. There was nothing suspicious or out of place anywhere. Good, Francoise. You can go. The old woman shuffled towards the door. On the threshold, she looked back. I will tell you one thing, monsieur. That Madame de Breuil, she is a bad one. Oh, yes, one woman knows about another. She is a bad one, remember that. And shaking her head sagely, Francoise left the room. Léonie Hullard, called the magistrate. Léonie appeared dissolved in tears and inclined to be hysterical. Monsieur Ote dealt with her adroitly. Her evidence was mainly concerned with the discovery of her mistress gagged and bound, of which she gave rather an exaggerated account. She, like Francoise, had heard nothing during the night. Her sister, Denise, succeeded her. She agreed that her master had changed greatly of late. Every day he became more and more morose. He ate less. He was always depressed. But Denise had her own theory. Without doubt, it was the mafia he had on his track. Two masked men? Who else could it be? A terrible society, that. 
It is, of course, possible, said the magistrate smoothly. Now, my girl, was it you who admitted Madame de Broye to the house last night? Not last night, monsieur, the night before. But Françoise has just told us that Madame de Broye was here last night. No, monsieur. A lady did come to see Monsieur Renaud last night, but it was not Madame de Broye. Surprised, the magistrate insisted, but the girl held firm. She knew Madame de Broye perfectly by sight. This lady was dark also, but shorter and much younger. Nothing could shake her statement. Have you ever seen this lady before? Never, monsieur. And then the girl added diffidently. But I think she was English. English? Yes, monsieur. She asked for monsieur, monsieur Renaud and quite good French, but the accent, one can always tell it, n'est-ce pas? Besides, when they came out of the study, they were speaking in English. Did you hear what they said? Could you understand it, I mean? Me, I speak the English very well, said Denise with pride. The lady was speaking too fast for me to catch what she said, but I heard Monsieur's last words as he opened the door for her. She paused, and then repeated carefully and laboriously. Yes, yes, but for God's sake, go now. Yes, yes, but for God's sake, go now, repeated the magistrate. He dismissed Denise, and after a moment or two for consideration, recalled Francoise. To her, he propounded the question as to whether she had not made a mistake in fixing the night of Madame de Broye's visit. Francoise, however, proved unexpectedly obstinate. It was last night that Madame de Broye had come. Without a doubt, it was she. Denise wished to make herself interesting. Voilà du. So she had cooked up this fine tale about a strange lady, airing her knowledge of English, too. Probably Monsieur had never spoken that sentence in English at all, and even if he had, it proved nothing, for Madame de Proye spoke English perfectly, and generally used that language when talking to Monsieur and Madame Renaud. You see, Monsieur Jack, the son of Monsieur, was usually here, and he spoke the French very badly. The magistrate did not insist. Instead, he inquired about the chauffeur and learned that only yesterday, Monsieur Renault had declared that he was not likely to use the car and that masters might just as well take a holiday. A perplexed frown was beginning to gather between Poirot's eyes. What is it? I whispered. He shook his head impatiently and asked a question. Pardon, Monsieur Bex, but without doubt Monsieur Renaud could drive the car himself? The commissary looked over at Francoise, and the old woman replied promptly, No, Monsieur did not drive himself. Poirot's frown deepened. I wish you would tell me what is worrying you, I said impatiently. See you not, in his letter Monsieur Renaud speaks of sending the car for me to Calais. Perhaps he meant a hired car, I suggested. Hmm, doubtless that is so. But why hire a car when you have one of your own? Why choose yesterday to send away the chauffeur on a holiday, suddenly, at a moment's notice? Was it that for some reason he wanted him out of the way before we arrived? All right, so that is the end of chapter three. Um, so I made this extra slide to sort of sum up the chapter that I'm going to go over right now. Hopefully that'll help clear up anything confusing. There are a lot of characters in this book. A lot of names get mentioned. Um, some of them are going to be more important than others later on. So I'm just going to touch on the people who lived in the, the house, um, the Villa Genevieve, right? That's Monsieur Renaud's house. So the people who lived there were Renaud, Madame Renaud, his wife, Monsieur Jack, Madame Renaud's son, um, Francoise, who was the older housekeeper, um, Leonie and Denise, who were younger servants and their sisters, and then there was a chauffeur. So the people that we heard from, sort of, so to speak, in the chapter were Francoise, Leonie, and Denise. We haven't met Monsieur Jack yet, and we don't really know anything about the wife other than she was gagged and bound, um, supposedly by the burglars who came in. Or at least two masked men, maybe not burglars. But the people who came in and grabbed the husband presumably also did this to the wife. They tied her up so she couldn't she couldn't scream and she couldn't escape. 
So Renault was murdered around 2 a.m. And they're pretty sure about that time because the wife's story lines up with that being the time. And then they could tell from the state the body was in about how long ago it had the he had died based on the way that the body looked. People can tell about how long ago someone dies. Um, so and then his body was left in a freshly dug grave on the edge of the golf field, which is the lynx. So there you have the title of the book. Renaud may have been having an affair with his neighbor lady, Madame de Broye. So that's kind of hard to say, but um, that's what it looks like, and that's what Francoise thinks. But that may or may not be who came to see him the night before he was murdered. It might have been a younger mystery woman. There are conflicting stories from the servants. Denise says that she thinks it was this this other woman. She says she knows Madame de Boya just by looking at her, and that woman was not Madame de Boya. Monsieur Renaud had written to Poirot saying he would send a car when he was on the way. But, knowing that Poirot was coming, he dismissed his chauffeur and said he wouldn't be needing the car. Poirot wonders why he would have said that after asking Poirot to come. After he'd already sent him the letter, asked him to come and help him, knowing he's on his way, or hoping he's on his way even, even if he didn't know, he still sends the chauffeur away. So, was he planning to send a different car? It's hard to say. And remember... In chapter 2, when Poirot and Hastings arrive in France, um, they're expecting to see a car based on the letter from Renaud, but there is no car. They have to hire one themselves. So there's probably something going on with the car and the chauffeur and stuff like that. Okay? All right. I hope that this has helped doing the little summary at the end. I'll be asking you about it on your exit ticket today so we can try and find the best way to keep doing this all together. All right. Have a good day, guys.